And uh, most of you, I've seen at many other programs, but those of you who haven't been here before, feel free to ask me questions about the room <clears throat> and to take a look around. Um, I'm the curator. Uh, my name's Joe Casulo. And um, as most of you know, we're not tax supported, although we're part of the library. And so we do ask for um, your support in the form of membership in NLHA, Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. And I also always put our little contribution plate out in the hallway for those of you who feel inclined toward a donation. Um, all the programming, all the adult programming in the library does come through the Heritage Room, and without the Heritage Room, I, I'm afraid that probably there wouldn't be any programming. So um, I do urge you to support the room. Tonight's reading is with Art Homer. He's written two books, uh, What We Did After the Rain, which was published in 1984, and his newest chapbook, Tattoos. Um, it is for sale in the gift shop, if anybody's interested, and he's here tonight so you could get it specially inscribed. And they are all signed. Um, in addition, Art has had poems published in four anthologies and 20 periodicals, including Midwest Quarterly, Missouri Review, and the Poetry Review. He's a graduate of the University of Montana with a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. He currently teaches in the Writers' Workshop at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Please join me in welcoming him tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I, uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd begin by reading um, um, some selections from the chat book and uh, explaining a little bit about how that, how that came together. Um, I, uh, I forgot to ask, uh, <laughs> so how long, how long am I reading? <laughs> The, uh, the chat book came together when um, I was uh, asked to put together a chat book uh, manuscript for um, the uh, Green Tower Press. It wasn't called the Green Tower Press, and they didn't have a name. It was uh, it's the first in the, in the series from uh, Northwest Missouri State University, and their idea was to put out a chat book a year, a modest little program, beginning with uh, people who were connected at some point in their life with, uh, with the state of Missouri, which, um, is, um, uh, which I am by birth. I guess I, I, uh, I was born in Missouri and through some fluke ended up back in the state again and uh, for a while teaching at Northwest and uh, before I moved to um, Omaha. So, um, so you know, being supported by the Missouri Arts Council is one of those things where the, uh, the Arts Council wants to know how it supports the arts in Missouri. They were looking for people with a connection to the state. I'd always felt that uh, chat books should be connected somehow, and I've always had a problem trying to write poems in a series of things that were connected. And uh, somehow it hit a hit on me to, 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 to uh, connect them by means of, of a, a particular poem. The poem's called A Book on Tattoos, and it was written in four parts. It came about because I was studying um, uh, Plains Indian history with uh, Joseph Brown, his book some of you may have read, uh, The Sacred Pipe. It's uh, the only other book I know of besides Black Elk Speaks written about Black Elk by somebody who actually knew him. So I was researching uh, anthropology, sociology, things like that. Came to this section of the anthropology sh shelf where sort of pop anthropology books get, get uh, shelved and came across this book whose title jumped out at me. It was called um, Art, Sex, and Symbol, The Mystery of Tattooing. And I particularly love the author's name. They seem appropriate to their subject matter. R.W.B. Scutt and uh, Christopher Gotch. And, uh, you know, you can put all the scum and crotch and all sorts of things together out of that. And, uh, and the book lived up to its title. Um, and it had large, colored, glossy photographs and, and the whole thing. So I took, I, when, I, when I tried to write about it, um, I took several themes out of the book and did little parts and uh, 
quoted little sections from the book. And I, I might say that, that no matter, uh, I might say in my own defense here, if, if some of this is, is uh, seems slightly risque, it's, it's really the, uh, the tamest part of the book. You know, if you want a real thrill, you should look up the book. Um, so the, the uh, chapbook, I unified the chapbook by, um, by putting poems in that related to the four sections of the original poem. So in the chapbook, the poem is, uh, the sections of the poem are uh, broken up to be headings or epigraphs for the, uh, for the poems that follow. And I thought tonight I'd, I'd read uh, each of the sections and a representative poem from, from each of those the sections. This is a book on tattoos, part one. On the wrong library shelf, it's not anthropology, cultural or general. What am I digging for? The fantasy sweetheart goes by no name. She may be changed, a rose slipped between her thighs or her hair darkened to match the hair of the wife who follows her into the arms across the blue waves of the stomach. The dream done, the girl may disappear forever behind the lowered tail, the thousand chaste eyes of a peacock. Um, this section of the, of the book, as I see it, dealt in a roundabout way with, with um, something country western singers called looking for love in all the wrong places. Uh, and uh, it sort of fits in with that, the idea of why when one gets tattoos to uh, enhance perhaps the sexuality or something. Um, the representative poem I'd like to read um, has a speaker who is, um, who's married and who, who doesn't realize that it's time to poem, but um, is still looking, uh, even, even looking, looking, uh, maybe in the right places, you know, looking, still looking in the marriage, still looking uh, in himself to find this, whatever it is that's supposed to happen. The Office of Night. Tonight, as the first winter wind cuts designs in my window, I want a slope of trees around me dropping a gentle mile to sea, want wind in fur bounds, indistinguishable from surf, the only view from any window, the lights of coastal freighters. The office of night, however, is wind, not wishes. For companionship, I have the neighbor's two square windows, the shade oak's ornamental branch, bowing the screen in my bedroom, if I envision the houses I've lived in, subtly connected by wind, the rooms tumble out of one another, no matter how I spin the magazine of walls and cock doors back against their night blue hinges. I admit to half believing in winter behind all walls, that I alone can see it through inadequate plaster and laugh, can hear it calling with my wife's intimate name for me, the voice of branches against windows. Call my name. I will answer. <clears throat> um, the, the second part begins with, um, the first line is from the book, and uh, deals with, with uh, an image, the butterfly, which is a typical image for tattoos, uh, especially, as it says later in, in the book, in one of the later sections, uh, women, women tend to get uh, images, symbols, uh, you know, flowers, uh, uh, butterflies, birds, things like that, uh, whereas men tend to get women uh, tattooed on them, or else, you know, the heart with mother and, and, and uh, slogans and things like that. Um, <coughs> So it deals with the image of the butterfly, and a number of the poems have that image in them. And, uh, and it deals with a childhood reminiscence, so a number of the poems have to do with childhood 
and reminiscent child, a child's view of the world. A book on tattoos, part two. There are 14 motives for tattooing. One of them, money. Someone should have called my uncle Prince and paid to see the dancer scything across his arm and her sister blew at 20 miles of mountain on his chest. Was she with him when he jumped ship in Panama, a working girl who fed him and called him El Mariposa, the butterfly? Um, <clears throat> a couple of things there. Um, when the poem was written, no one, but no one outside of Minneapolis maybe, had heard of the rock star print. This uh, to call to call him Prince and capitalize that the, the, the Prince uh, I'm speaking of is mentioned in the book as a famous tattooed man, which uh, sort of is anyway. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Prince's uh, rock star's uh, image fits with the poem anyway. Um, and El Mariposa, of course, is the Spanish for a butterfly. Aside from the, the images of, uh, of butterflies in the poem, <clears throat> uh, the one I'm, I'm reading tonight has more to do with, with the other element in this section, the childhood reminiscence. And um, <clears throat> in this case, maybe the sort of childhood attitude gone wrong, that point in the child's life when they think uh, things are wrong, uh, think they understand things, uh, often think they're, they're pretty tough and cynical. Uh, and really, a child is a child, is a child. Um, it's called facing up. He's a, he's a speaker in here thinks, thinks he's a tough guy. Facing up. Our house on Lincoln Street slept green, its light tinged with evening, broken upon afternoon. Next door, the empty lot we practiced batting in, and opposite, Mrs. Wall, dying happily on morphine, which didn't help, she said. Not that we understood pain or how the thing that works to stop it stops working one day. If something, baseball, dope, drink, or luck, stops it for good, it takes money, and all pain wants more than you've got. Eventually, like Mrs. Wall, you die. Out of money forever, you don't have to be afraid anymore, afraid of losing or evening, of going broke, afraid of the bad scene and nothing to do with your life but work at not going broke in another bad scene. Don't fool yourself. <coughs> Part three of the, of the chapbook uh, is centered around um, a particular tattoo, um, a particular motif. It's done in a number of different styles depending on the tattoo artist, and uh, it's called uh, the fox hunt motif, or as they, as they style it in the book, the famous fox hunt motif. Um, uh, other, uh, um, the uh, Constantine of Vienna is, uh, is another famous tattooed man. Uh, most of these people were employed by circuses. Um, uh, Sides of Man is pretty much, a, pretty much a description first of, first of the, the tattoos um, that this Constantine had and then of this fox hunt. Book on Tattoos, Part 3. If you are not corporeal, as Vienna's Constantine, able to bear 300 designs, Burmese elephants, those original caryatids nosing your pectorals long nights after their mahouts have deserted, perhaps you'd prefer the famous fox hunt motif. Starting always from the shoulder, the cortege courses southeasterly, the hurdle of the spine stand by a stallion in fine lines. Across your right buttock, 
eager whippets and beagles chase the elusive tail into its hole. Remember, this is, these are the tamer tattoos. Uh, <clears throat> they don't have anything to do with, uh, you know, uh, tattoos and mutilation put together or any of those sorts of things, which are some of the more bizarre things in this book. This, uh, <clears throat> uh, pun fully intended, this, this section has more to do with the underside of life, if you will. And uh, the, uh, the poem, um, I'm reading from this, this section, uh, deals with uh, sort of working class life, working in a factory called downtime which uh, anybody who's ever worked in production knows is that time when the machines aren't running, when they're not running the rate on you, you know, uh, the time that's cut out from your so many pieces per hour. And uh, companies don't like downtime, you know, and uh, workers, of course, do. They love downtime. After you jam the punch press, its rhythm stays in your palm, persistent as packing tape or talk of divorce. The company is losing money with so much downtime showing up on your card. Two hours till lunch break, the break for waiting cars. Last year, Sonny, on swing shift, picked up his lunch and bum knee, racing the train to the crossing, racing to punch in. It's a morgue here, a man hurt in a bar, Lamont on the forklift, the fool. But George, how to make a knife in the heart look like industrial accident. Just when the sun from the skylight brightens across the floor, low clouds, light winds behind it. Someone from maintenance, late and hurried, limps up from the rear. Tools trailing from his belt like dirty children. He's paid to care, you, to sit on this packing crate and remember this is no picnic, no summer job. You will retire from here if you're lucky after divorce, after George, and after selling your car piece by piece to keep the money from being eaten up in settlement. Better after all than the morgue, better than taking your break in the heart, better than most accidents. <clears throat> Um, the last part of the chapbook is um, centered around a um, uh, a part of the a part of the um, the tattoo book um, that discusses tattooed women, why women get tattoos in particular. Um, so the first the first line here and. Uh, first line of each stanza, first line and half of the first stanza, is, um, is from the book. I take no responsibility for them. The only thing I did with the first line is that I broke it, you know, in, in order to, uh, in order to uh, capitalize on a pun. And once again, it sort of, it sort of ties certain experiences of mine together with things in the book. Book on Tattoos, Part 4. Quote, The fairer sex generally is not prone to acquiring tattoos. End quote. Even poor Nellie, well paid by Barnum and Bailey, stood up poorly in photographs. She was too thin, seemed ready to weep, her breath rising unmarked from the blue night of her body. Quote, the first thing men want to do is kiss it, end quote. Go ahead, a bit of color beneath the shoulder blade, El Mariposa won't bite back. When you've forgotten the first thing you wanted, listen. Listen to the big rose 
of the lungs swell and fall away. Along the bent stem of the vertebrae, the wings scissor together. <clears throat> And I think the operative line in, in that section is uh, when you've forgotten the first thing you wanted, you know, the way goals and aspirations change. So many of the poems have to do with that. <coughs> and the poem from this section I'll read is uh, called Incident Beside the Tarchio, and it bears an, uh, um, an epigraph from Emily Dickinson, which I happened upon and seemed to fit. Um, the reason I happened upon it was that I was visiting a friend, the poet Rick Robbins, and we were both talking about um, the uh, Poetry Society of America contest, and they have a number of them. Um, there's one for the, uh, the best verse suitable to setting to music. There's one for the best um, sonnet. There's one for the best narrative. There's one for the best poem in any, there's several that just say the best poem in any style, form, or length under 300 lines. It's, they all have these little rules. So, so you go through your poems for the year and you say, well, what have I got that might net me 500 bucks in this prize, you know? And uh, because, you know, uh, the, you know, pay isn't good in business generally. Uh, so if you've got some poems around, you may as well. Well, the hang-up for me, uh, and seemingly for him, was this, this this one, any poem in any style reminiscent of relating to or alluding to the work of Emily Dickinson. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know, you know, I had no idea what I was going to try to do for that one. I'd set it as a goal to try and make each of them, you know. So uh, he obviously had been doing the same thing because he had he had that collected works of Emily Dickinson out in his study on his desk, and it was lying open. A bunch of little short uh, things um, in this particular area. And it was open to this epigraph, and this epigraph fit this poem, and uh, there you have it. Um, <clears throat> I didn't win. Incident beside the Tarchio, and the epigraph reads, the deer invites no longer than it evades the hound. I cannot adore the doe half hamstrung by one of the senses I have come walking to forget. Forward as the woman she is not, she sways toward me as if I were a student of sorrow. Her rowing gait a waltz of long approach. Leg flagged by a ribbon of flesh bright as the silk tie I gave my wife. Less adoring than a younger man, I can at least walk this right-of-way abandoned by rail lines and town. And the half-step between ties, this slender offer opens itself from a stand of honey locusts. Town dogs yammer, not enough cover to save her, never a river wild enough though I smell the intimate current of graze and wound which tames the dogs to butchery. When we are close, she bolts, executes a brief essay and resolves through dry milkweed, last year's deadfall, and into rich potential of plowed field. Circling, she is reconciled to saplings where last spring two cuckoos slipped dark-browed on their errands. If I neglect mine, I wear my dilemma on my head, wish dogs turned on me. Here is no lover of my hunt for routes other than highways to Middle River and more field. Though I turn to Oak, I cannot still myself enough to move her away from open ground. The chase, flies hunting open flesh to bury their young. When I wave my arms, my shout raises jubilation from the town behind me. Backyards sprout a wilderness of cries. <clears throat> well, it's, it's a... Chat books, by definition, are short, so I'm not going to read any more from this, or I'll, I'll have read the whole thing. 
Um, To, to sort of to sort of um, lead off, I said I have I have problems writing at least consciously on a single theme. Though sometimes I do find uh, two or three or four poems um, in which an image or a similar image or a um, you know uh, a theme seems to come up again and again. And uh, <coughs> the um, about the time of the uh, the poem about the uh, the doe who'd been been cut up trying to cross the fence. Um, I had a number of uh, poems come to me, reminiscences of um, of similar scenes, um, and I I guess also I'd been reading. Um, you know, it's strange how these things come together. I mean, this happened. Um, I had been <coughs> excuse me. I'd been reading. Um, um, Paul Shepard's book called Thinking Animals, um, wonderful book about the relationship of the, the evolution of human intelligence and, uh, and, and people's relationship to animals. And so a number of these things were floating around in my head. Um, this poem's called Killing the Calf. What does it matter, the calf danced at your heel, balking only at rope? You tied it to the stump and shot it cleanly, your hand nearly steady under the 38th weight. Strange as gray smoke off the brain, nothing so trite as prayer, what it says has the shape of sky. Yesterday, quiet after loading the truck down to the axles with firewood, you sat shutting out the mute woods after the saws scream, the scream now of children sent back to the house. Quiet, a friend witnesses the job done, coaches your fingers in that frisky little dance, guiding the knife. The left hand gauges for the right, the depth, brisket to chest to miss the taint of gut. Your friend holds the gun while you smoke, take a walk that cuts too deep away from hunt toward hand-fed echoes of your own thought. The bullet comes last. First, you load shot, the tacit primer of chores, the child taught to teach the calf suck and nudge with those same fingers you now edge between skin and bone. The fine grain charge is only a way to name what you eat. The length you sectioned from deadfall wait to be sawn and split. Wind moves fur tops in a sky which claims, like the small matter which brought two men into the autumn field, importance. Though raisins gathered in their crowns are only thoughts and will soon move off, leaving the contrast of limb and sky inviolate, you brought home memory in the dogs, who will bring you gifts of this, We'll visit this place over and over, no matter how deep you bury the gut, disguise the ground. Last one is addressed to a to a you, you know, and a, a number of um, I just said you know. Yeah. Um, there is a wonderful essay I believe it's by Jonathan Holden called the misuse of the second person plural or second person singular or whatever it is. Uh, the misuse of the word you. A number of a number of poems use the word you. You do this. You do that. Right. You will never feel the same again, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of that a lot. It can mean anything. It's very easy. It also establishes a sense that 
you can't in a more narrative form like fiction you know you can't write a uh, piece of fiction saying you got up on April 15th you know, and wondered who'd been in your house you could, but it's not one of the conventions. And poetry has this convention of using um, this you. It, it gets away from the overly confessional, sometimes overly confessional feeling, first person. I did this, I did that, I feel like this, I feel like that. Um, so, um, I don't know, at, at different times I've tried to be conscious of that. I think I think I feel best about it when I'm using it um, either as a definite person being addressed, that sort of that sort of monologue or or conversation that's overheard, you know, um, speaking to a to a definite person. Otherwise it it, it, it often really means I. And we may as well be honest about it and say, I do this, I do that. Here's a little a little poem in the first person. And deals with um, another another theme I find myself dealing with. Seasonal seasonal changes. Seasonal images. This is called Homily for Autumn. It's written in it's written in a as well well uh, Say it's written in couplets, in a rhyme couplet. Homily for Autumn. Though I detest it, the pear tastes most like the time of year I love best for its wind, and the way it leaves behind leaves and the rags of horizon to sink with the last of the garden back into last year's mile. A great owl of sleep takes the squirrel with the notched tail to nest, Trees hurl their fruit across the grass, the swift that clouds its worried turns. So the homeowner rakes and burns his small account of autumn, admires his work as lies must please liars. I think I think using the first person starting out, I, I you know I like autumn, I hate pears. Uh, um, a simple sort of stance to take, I and mean, you know nothing earth shattering, but. Um, Sort of, um, I don't. I don't actually bring the pronoun up again, allowing me to write the poem in this way. And also, um, though I, I called it a homily, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a vituperative little homin, hom, homin, homily, homily, uh, and and takes a nasty turn at the end, which if it works, I mean, it works because the speaker is speaking for himself. This one has a we in it, and uh, it's um, a we, which is the speaker, the speaker and uh, his immediate family. I think he and his his wife, his town, the people, his close friends, um, not not including all of humanity. You know, it's not trying to speak for everyone. So uh, hopefully. This is a poem because it, it limits itself to to a believable we, and, and it comes from living in a small town. And in a small town, um, you do begin to think in terms of we. What what are we doing? You know, even if you feel alienated from the town, there's sometimes when you catch yourself thinking we do this and we do that. Summer solstice. Still cool enough for crickets, the morning creaks toward my back porch. The garbled dialect of starling describes a town so set in its ways that a local who paints his house blue returns from vacation to find it white again. The spruce, like birds, are introduced. Not so black crickets, omnipresent in discarded charcoal bags and grass clippings molding in sun. We love here when we can bear the heat, working out a tenuous truce with church and state, a peace with the lawns of the rich, though they accuse us through the goggle-eyed stares of cast-iron stable boys. 
We grow gardens. Tomatoes and peppers burn our palates in season, but grow so well we can't stop using them. In spring we find one morel so large we splice it into stuffing for two omelets. See how our lives prescribe us. Wherever, wherever we walk, we are home. No matter that we'll die and be buried in clay we fought from our shoes and out from the base of our tongues. The grass has gone to seed. Sun gathers crickets crossing the walk. Their color walnut, cross-grained when seen in the light. Truly black are the squirrels knocking undersized pears into the grass. The first fruits of the year disappoint. Small and hard, they are as nicely formed as our hearts. We might can them, though we know where a dozen quarts pale in a cellar. Past the windmill, impaled by a maple, the abandoned farmyard awaits the caterpillar. Come to terrace the field. On shelves, ranks of jars fester at their mouths with the sweetness of summer's past. <clears throat> After two days' rain, rain bridges streams to water our stock at those peregrinations of scents which dip only far enough into current to let dazzled Herefords approach that bandsaw surface which could, it seems, cut their legs off. Birds yodel off-key with stones gargling in the bloated ditch where half this valley gets its water. The river, archaeologists of root systems, presents a dark view of Douglas fir, the understory of upswept branches, bark obscured by cataracts of pitch, favoring small boys with knots in their hair as they climb. A navy of wood chips navigates the viaduct that cost one deer its hood. Raking cement walls, it had the sense to know drowning, but lacked that acquiescence to drift for the section, the county finds neither time nor money to tile, so that the current crawls collapsed banks. We who come with rifles know this, and know we oversimplify those details of eating and killing our dogs bark at us all morning. We know how we make intricate turbulence when drift would save us our errors of intellect and emotion. When we stop firing, and after the doe finishes scouring the bank with exposed leg bones, a bird unseen in the flooded meadow, water pipit, someone says, resumes the piping it has kept up day after day after two days' rain. <clears throat> well, that one, uh, in its, uh, in its um, kind of backwards way, ended up being a spring poem despite itself. Uh, started out being a poem about how things die in the spring, and, and they do. At least uh, then, uh, the death uh, comes to light then, you know, uh, the thaw and everything. Um, <clears throat> but did end up, uh, for me, on, on some sort of, of uh, note of, of light going on and the like. Um, but often a personal sense of, of the season um, is at odds with uh, you know what we generally think of, what we think we should think about the season, how we think we should be feeling. Um, this poem is uh, set in winter, but um, it deals with, uh, is, is, and while it starts off with this sort of image as you might expect of, of winter, it ends up being a love poem. Wind chill for Aaron. 
Everything wrong in the cold aches into a sun confused as those painted landscapes this evening recalls at horizon. A purple smudge for the windrow nudging sky into its flat facets of sub-zero blue. I would take you anywhere, even to the chapel where your friend lies perfect. So perfect he could have been the man who deserved to take your breath off into the sky he is now. He is dressed for travel, and when you leave with me, still far in your face, I see my gift. I leave the blue pews, the stained sunrise of glass, the room empty of its bloom, though flowers remain. For as long as a feast charm lasts, small birds weather this year of coldest night. Their wings whisper its right to hold you, wind after wind, and nights of good death there are not flowers enough to console. You are years of me, and I want you in the face of all friends, loves, and winters. Great themes are nothing, as is my mouth, the tongue aching down into my chest for the hours I have no hint of you, but the slight scent already fading from rooms deep in your touch. I cannot surround myself as you surround me, no matter how I petition my own body, ask the dead and the living before the mirror of my night window. And sleep is a friend I do not care to know. The neighbors fight the whole night you are gone. Morning, the stones of the retaining wall shelter a junco for the moment. The world is small, a gray bird and young elms creaking in yet another sky made of the same air that holds us each night we forget ourselves in this wind freezing us into one another <laughs>